I don't have part timers today. Alzheimer's is all the time. <laughs> part timers is part of the time. Uh, all right, we're in Philippians again today, or I should say, still. We will be slowly marching towards the passage that uh, Len went through, and I, I look forward to doing that. That's kind of <laughs> the, um, the, the ultimate part of the story uh, when we get there. Um, but we're in Philippians, and uh, we're gonna, we'll start off at verse 12. I think we'll probably only get through, what is it, verse, uh, verse 17. Um, in fact, that's what I'm going to probably count on doing is stopping there. The story, I think, you know, continues on. But this is where, after the Paul's introduction, um, Paul is now looking to really start um, centering on the aspect of what, what does it mean to be convictionally aligned? To be of to be unified, to be on the same page, and that's really the nature of the book of Philippians. Uh, even the, the passage we were reading that uh, Len was reading this morning, that the word we looked at for um, conviction, or think, or rational, um, is mentioned three times. Um, it's mentioned ten times throughout the whole book. It's really the, the kind of the hidden theme that's there. Uh, but when you begin to look at the frequency of words, and Paul uses them there. Um, they're, they're for, it's, again, they're, when, when God repeats himself, it's worthy of sitting up and taking note why that, when that's happening. So let's read. Um, let's go ahead and read down to, to verse 17, but we'll, we'll, we'll read it and then we'll, we'll take it apart. Uh, so Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. I'm just going to read verse 18 as we, we, we wind up the section. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. And so again, we'll pick up that phrase, I think, uh, next week. But when Paul you know, begins to talk about uh, the circumstances, you know, Paul uses the same construction uh, in, in the book of Colossians and Ephesians. And again, remember that those are both the prison epistles. Um, uh, so Paul's, again, in prison and, and uh, having to provide all of his own things. And he's, and he's looking at his circumstances that are there. He's reminding the people that he's hearing or he's talking to that the circumstances are difficult. They're not to be pretended that they're just, you know, it's not, and Len kind of alluded to this in the last message. He's not looking at, at his circumstances and somehow glibly saying, well, I just have joy. <laughs> it's no joy to be in prison. And I mentioned before that suicide, there was a high rate of suicide with prison, associated with prison because it was, it was, it was uh, painful, it was dreadful. You often exposed to uh, the elements. Uh, you had to keep your own bedding, your own food, your clothing. Um, and I, you know, there's some question whether house arrest in prison is the is the case here, and I think it's prison, but that's that's another day. Um, in, in either case, it's no pleasant place to be, and uh, and yet what Paul's saying is, even in the midst of my circumstances, um, they've turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. What Paul's doing in this whole passage, he's sort of sending a newsy letter, if you will. Um, he's he's. Uh, trying to assure the Philippians that other opportunities have opened up by the fact that he's a place that he wouldn't normally go. He wouldn't normally go to prison. It's not where, uh, any of you ever hear of Newgate prison in England? Okay, this is where people went to die. <laughs> Newgate, yeah. I, I wanna say uh, uh, Bunyan was there. Um, uh, I think Bunyan's, uh, John Bunyan's parents both died there from exposure and it, it was not it was that kind of a place uh this is back in the what early late 1500s early 1600s if i remember right um it was it was no place to go and yet we wouldn't have um public progress were it not for bunyan having been in prison and having the time to think about spending 12 years in prison 
um, for preaching the gospel. There are sometimes opportunities that open up that you normally wouldn't do. Um, other opportunities have opened up, and even so, Paul is grateful for the supply to his physical and spiritual relief. Again, we, I've mentioned before that Paul, every time he goes to prayer, is remembering the Philippians. That's kind of the, the, scent or the scenario that you're looking at here. Paul spends a great deal of time in prayer, and every time he does, he remembers the Philippians. And every time he remembers the Philippians, he remembers this cordiality, this bond he has with them of their supply of his need even in the midst of circumstance. If it's a shame enough that it was a high rate of suicide so that I don't have to endure prison, it was also a shame to be associated with people who went to prison. And yet the Philippians didn't think anything about that. They were glad to send Epaphroditus. And, uh, and we'll find out later that, that Timothy was there with Paul as well. So uh, circumstances being what they are, certainly not pleasant, but because of what has gone on in the, uh, in the, in the uh, prison there, other opportunities have opened up. He's been able to proclaim the gospel to the Praetorian Guard to the point that, as he says in verse, verse 13, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. You know, when you're chained to somebody and you're proclaiming the gospel, you they're not going to be mobile enough to just say, well, my time's up. I got to go. There's a roast waiting for that supper. Now you're you're up and going. You don't want you don't want to be there necessarily, but you're not going anywhere. You're likely chained to the person on your left and to the person on your right. Um, so the, the the it's become known to the whole Praetorian Guard, and and in in some sense, it's again for the greater progress of the gospel. The idea of progress is a, it's a movement forward to an improved state. Right? It's an advancement or a furtherance. And the good news is that some advancement or some progress in sharing the gospel throughout the whole Roman Empire is made just by the fact that Paul being in prison, chained to the people next to him and around him. Not in spite of the circumstances, actually, but because of the circumstances. And that kind of puts a different spin on the circumstances that we go through in life, doesn't it? That were there by divine appointment. Um, one of the things I would love to do sometime is a whole serious study on, on the providence of God. Now, just to give you some idea that that's not gonna happen this week, next week, next year, probably. Um, John Piper's just finished his, uh, a very a huge book, like 700 pages on the providence of God. And so he's been at it, he said, he's been collecting snippets and comments and thoughts, and he's been putting them together for 20 years. So it's, it's been that kind of a cumulative effect. So, um, it's not gonna be something we'll do, we'll pick up right away. <laughs> but uh, I, I, in some respects, I think we, we tend to lose our understanding of the providence of God. That God through his sovereignty and God in order to, because of his sovereignty is able to orchestrate details to make sure his plan comes into, into fruition. That would be my simple definition of providence. But it's God, because of his sovereignty, putting his plan into place and executing his plan and perfecting his plan and, be, and making sure that it's mission accomplished on every plan that he makes. That's an awesome statement. When you begin to look at the pervasiveness of all the things that go wrong, just think about the providence of God in having Jesus born and the number of prophecies that are fulfilled and all that God did to orchestrate all those prophecies and all that God did to orchestrate Jesus dying on the cross on that day is just incredible just to think about it, or God orchestrating that. And that's God's providence of play. He's using his sovereignty to make sure his will comes out. Um, so when we, when we think about it, again, the progress is the, is the important part. Paul is almost assuring them that they, what they had feared was a bad thing was really a good thing. Now, for those of you who grew up in rural Illinois, this reminds me of hee -haw. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Say again. That's <laughs> what I thought you said. Uh, you know, some guy in his uh, in his overalls, someone saying, "Oh, that's a bad thing." And he said, "No, that's a good thing." And they would go on to describe how much that good thing that was. Well, no, that's a bad thing. And, and it was a guy arguing essentially with himself. Well, I'll let you look up the uh, video YouTube on uh, bad thing, good thing. On, on, I see Brian's already at it, so we're, <laughs> we're, we're on it. <laughs> Uh, but it does bring back to mind that what we think as sometimes bad, 
but by God's providence, things can be good. And again, back to contentment. One of the things about content is, is understanding God's providence and, and trusting in that and resting in that. That doesn't mean I like my circumstances. He's not, God's not calling us to like them at all. But we do need to see God's hand in those circumstances. And in that case, what Paul's able to say is that because of my circumstances, because of God's providence, because of God's sovereignty and his orchestration of details, a greater progress, an advancement, a furtherance for the gospel has happened because I'm talking to people I wouldn't get to talk to otherwise. And they're a captive, a literal captive audience. They can't go anywhere. They have to hear. And every time a guard, a new guard gets chained to me, he gets to hear the gospel as well, over and over and over again. And what began again might be a bad thing in thought is really a good thing. And, uh, and Paul, Paul likely gets this idea that the Philippians were concerned about it from Epaphras. Epaphras was sent from Philippi to Paul, wherever Paul was in prison, to take care of him. Uh, and, and that's, I mean, that's, we, we find Titus doing the same kind of thing, telling Paul what was going on in, in, uh, in Corinth. And we'll find Timothy being sent to Philippi so, so that Paul can get a, a good message back. Um, it doesn't mean it's pleasant or easy, but Paul could see the providence of God, the hand of God, and how things were turning out. And he says here, uh, um, so that my imprisonment, and literally the word is my bonds, my shackles, uh, it's well known what's going on. And the idea of being well known, well known is it, it's plain, it's evident, it's for all to see. And Paul's really reflecting, when he talks about all, it's, it's spreading throughout the entire Praetorian Guard who's keeping him under arrest. And they in turn are trusting. Uh, Paul in turn is, is trusting. <clears throat> Verse 13, so that in my imprisonment in the cause of Christ, has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. The idea of, of trusting that's there um, is to be so convinced that one puts his confidence in something. That is to, to depend on it, to trust in it. And, and the, he, he's really talking about then most of the brethren, and it's interesting he calls brethren, because then he's referring to people who have actually trusted in the Lord. They've trusted in the Lord, and furthermore, they're trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, <clears throat> and they have far more courage to speak the word of the Lord without, word of God without fear. Again, you see Paul taking on suffering with a content heart here, and then you, you see this rippling throughout the whole passage. So it's only appropriate that Len speaking on contentment would choose Philippians for that. But you see that the brethren there content to the point of they know that suffering may come as a result of their sharing. If it happened to Paul, and Paul's a Roman citizen, it can happen to us, right? They're not, they're not overly concerned, though, that that's the case. It may happen. It might happen. It probably will happen. But they're not bent out of shape. They're not worrying, they're not wringing their hands. They're in fact, again, trusting is, is to be convinced that one puts his trust in something and they're trusting in the Lord to carry them through that. And that's where, again, you get the idea of contentment that's there. This is, in some sense, verse 14 is, is sort of the example of contentment throughout the whole passage. How in spite of the circumstances, because of the circumstances, Paul gets to display what's really in his heart as he endures the persecution. But in, in spite of the circumstances, the other brothers then learn contentment as well. And they have far more courage to speak the word, uh, even, even because of it. So again, the, the idea of imprisonment is the idea of bonds. Um, a, a special interest, in uh, this is a quoting from a guy named Moises Silver, Silva. Of special interest is Paul's use of the term bonds in, in uh, chapter 7 and then here 12 to 17 where the apostle directly links his imprisonment with the progress and spread of the gospel. For one thing, the guard, palace guard and the others have become aware he wears his fetter for Christ's sake. Again, every time that Paul talks to someone or talk, especially talks to someone new, he's bringing the conversation back to Christ. Um, so one of the classes that started this week for me is an evangelism class. Now evangelism itself doesn't scare you. You're just talking about what the Lord's done in your life. But creating the opportunity to talk about what the Lord's doing in life, that's, an, that's a frightening thing. First time I started to take a class was 
in the height of COVID. You ever tried to share the gospel in, somebody, in the middle of a pandemic when you're locked in your house and can't go anywhere? Um, but one of, the, one of the things that the school has struck up a, a, a relationship with is an organization that's used like by the Billy Graham Association and several Baptist universities. And when you say, do you want to know something about the gospel, then you click on a button and you get sent off to, uh, um, we need him, I think is the name of the site. And then they have people standing by at all times um, to be able to chat with you about what the gospel is. And so you, you can actually uh, uh, sign up to do that. Uh, it, uh, as a student, I get an express route to, uh, to, to being a, a gospel presenter. But uh, what you can do, if you actually were interested in sharing the gospel, if that's a desire in your heart and you just don't have the opportunities you'd like, you can sign up to be a gospel presenter, you know, someone giving the gospel. And what's interesting is that these are people who want to know. So you're not having to drop back and say, you know, let me explain. You don't have to go into so much detail to prove that God is the creator, that sin and man is corrupted with sin, that Jesus Christ is solved solution, solution and you need a response, right? It's a very simple presentation. You, you, you can kind of cut through some of that because people there, there, people are there to hear. People have asked to know. Now, none of these guards are pressing the no Jesus now button, if you will. None of them are saying, I'm going to go get shackled to Paul. That's the equivalent of saying, I'm going to, I, I'll, I'll sign up voluntarily to go get shackled to Paul. I'm not sure they did that. But they knew that, as Paul says, in the whole Praetorian Guard, they knew they were going to get talked to. Paul's using his imprisonment as the opportunity to talk to others. And, and Paul's letting them know. Um, and what the, the other effect of it is, is it makes the other believers more courageous in proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Um, according to John Chrysostom, is that right, Gina? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> okay. Um, he says this about this, this whole affair. Now, Nero had cast him into prison. So truly also the Caesar Nero then, just as any robber and burglar, while all were sleeping a deep and unconscious slumber, robbing the property of all, breaking into marriage chambers, subverting houses, displaying every form of wickedness. When he saw Paul having lighted a lamp throughout the whole world, the world of his teaching, and reproving his wickedness, exerted himself both to extinguish what was preached and to put the teachers out of the way in order that he might be allowed with authority to do anything he pleased. And after binding that holy man, cast him into prison. See, the Chrysostom is a, was, a, uh, was in the early second century, I mean, literally like 100, 110 AD or so. Um, what he's ref reflecting on in history is how Nero threw Paul into prison and thinking, you know, they could silence him. In fact, made the candle burn all the more bright and gave people all around Paul the uh, courage to continue on sharing. Know that uh, if it happened to Paul, it could happen to us. We, we know that going in. We're not worrying about what can happen. We know what could happen, but God is our strength and our supply. And, uh, and, and Nero was the one who, who began all of that. So again, the idea of, of uh, he says, uh, because of my imprisonment, have far more courage um, to be brave enough, uh, to be daring, is really the idea that's there. And so the people who are coming in on the side, looking in, began to take courage from Paul's imprisonment and what they saw Paul taking advantage of, people being shackled to him and yet being able to give the gospel completely. So in, in verses 12 to 14, you, you just start to see this whole aspect of, of, we sometimes can overestimate, we can start to worry and get concerned about our circumstances and what they'll bring. But when you begin to have a handle on God and what he has planned, it, it sort of changes things. Um, the early church took, took courage from the example of Paul and after the death of, of Constantine. So think in the, uh, in the middle 300s or so. So the church is still pretty new and they've just come in favor with the Roman Empire. They're not used to that. Um, right before Constantine, just a, a few emperors, one or two emperors before Constantine was Diocletian. Everybody remember Diocletian? Nobody remembers Diocletian, do they? <laughs> Nobody remembers the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> For you, uh, Monty Python friends. Um, now, Diocletian was probably the worst persecution that the Christians ever endured to date. To date now, the worst. 
And I, someday we'll go through what those were. Um, but Diocletian had, was busy taking it. But um, after, Constantine comes into play. Um, you know, again, it's still some question of whether he was a believer or not, but he treated the Christians very kindly. And uh, he would be the one that would start the, uh, the church councils, the first ecumenical councils, um, because he didn't like disunity and he didn't like disunity in the church. Uh, Constantine would, would die and one of his sons, Constantius, Constantius um, took over. And while the Nicene and Constantinopolitan creeds, I, I practice three days a week on that. So, <laughs> um, while the, the Nicene creed, which is what you would know by, were, were convened at the behest of um, Constantius's father, Constantine, um, those councils were for Orthodox or Alexandrian view and against what's called Arianism. Everybody familiar with Arianism? So we get, you're getting church history in spades today. So, so Arianism is essentially saying, Arian became famous for the line, there was a time when he was not. Meaning, talking about Jesus, that Jesus was created, he was not eternal, that Jesus was um, not God, but like God, that he would be maybe adopted would be another phrase. And I'm not sure that's area in particular, but Jesus didn't, wasn't eternal. He wasn't always the son of God. He was created. And so Arius, Arius hung on to there. There was a time when he was not, but, which gives you an idea. Arius was the guy who was on trial during the, the councils of Nicaea and his ideas got rejected saying that Jesus not only was truly God and truly man, but truly always he's eternal. Um, so, uh, going back to my, my point, because I've not interrupted myself, uh, again, as is my habit for the last four years, um, but the, the, the issue is that um, between Arius, which was the, the Arius of Alexander, uh, Alexandria, Egypt, and the Nicene view was more of the Orthodox view, um, and Constantine would approve of the Nicene view, that Jesus is eternal and co-equal with the Father. Arius said, no, not so much. Arius gets rejected, really evicted. And yet that didn't end the issue. Because when Constantine died, his son switched sides, right? And so everything that had been done for the last 30, 40 years went topsy-turvy. And all of, all of a sudden now, all the people with Orthodox view found themselves excommunicated from church, meant to leave the empire. Some to the point of um, the, the way the, the expression goes, some were headed towards execution because Const Constantius wanted to make a point, uh, but he said, he, it said about him, he later repented, much like most, like Pharaoh did in Egypt. Um, so again, Athanasius then, all about the same time. Athanasius is one of my, one of the heroes of the faith that we should do a study of just by himself. Athanasius is a guy who would carry the banner for the deity of Christ and would help explain the Trinity. And he's one of the heroes of the faith of the 300s. Just one of those guys, if you, if you see something from Athanasius, grab a hold of it, read it. He's the guy you want to emulate. So when the, when the bishops, this is Athanasius says in the, um, towards the late 300s, when the bishops heard the, this, the threats, they were utterly amazed. The threats against the bishops who said, Nicaea for us, and, the, and Constantine, and exile for you now. When the bishops heard this, they were utterly amazed and stretching forth their hands to God. They used great boldness of speech against him, teaching him that the kingdom was not his, but God's, who had given it to him, whom also they bid him fear, lest he should suddenly take it away from him. And they threatened him with the day of judgment and warned him against infringing ecclesiastical order and mingling Roman sovereignty with the constitution of the church and against introducing the Arian heresy into the church of God. But he would not listen to them, nor permit them to speak further, but threatened them so much more, and drew his sword against them, and gave orders for some of them to be led to execution, although afterwards, like Pharaoh, he repented. The holy men, therefore, shaking off the dust and looking up to God, neither feared the threats of the emperor, nor betrayed their cause before the drawn sword, drawn sword but received their banishment as a service pertaining to the ministry. And as they passed along, they preached the gospel in every place and city, although they were in bonds, proclaiming the, the Orthodox faith, 
anathematizing the Aryan heresy, anathematizing, anathematizing, <laughs> uh, let me read it out loud, anathematizing, um, condemning, right? Uh, Paul would use that word in Galatians. Uh, anathematizing the Aryan heresy and stigmatizing the recantation of Versatius and Valens. But this was contrary to the intention of their enemies for the greater was the distance of their place of banishment. So much more was the hatred against them increased while the wanderings of these men were but the heralding of their impiety. For who that saw them as passed along did not greatly admire them as confessors and renounce them and abominate the others, calling them not only impious men, but executioners and murderers and everything rather than Christians. Now, that's a long quote that, I'm, that I normally do from Athanasius. What am I saying? As a result of the circumstances of Constantius, in condemning the bishops and the Orthodox bishops and the banishment of them, and the banishment in prison or in chains to else places elsewhere, they did exactly what Paul did and proclaimed the gospel in ways and places that they never would have reached otherwise. The early church did the same thing Paul did. They were, by God's providence, sent to go elsewhere. And instead of you know, bitterly weeping and moaning and going to the polls and saying, you know, you know 47%, or, you know, the, the popularity rating of Constantius is declining, and he's down to 47%, they instead took up the cause, cause and said, we'll take this opportunity to proclaim the gospel. I find it fascinating that, that Paul's example doesn't just resonate, even as he's talking about here in Philippi, it, his example doesn't resonate with the local people just now, it resonates throughout history. And this, this is where it gets kind of exciting is you start to see people getting hold of and grasping what God wants to do through them. And God, every once in a while, kicking us out of our comfort zone, literally and metaphorically. And we can be content with that and use it as an opportunity or we can moan and complain and lament and not get anywhere, but there's no progress of the gospel on that side. But the other side, you see God using that pattern over and over and over again for his glory. All right, so let me stop there. Any, any questions? I know that, yeah, I mean. I'm, I'm rereading a book called The Call. By us, Guinness, mm -hmm. and uh, somehow what I'm learning there again is resonating in terms of our call and the call of Paul. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the basis for his strength is that his call is first to Christ, and secondary would be the other things, yeah. the second call. And so I, I really sense that the people that would talk about Christ are those that are first called to him, to himself, and understand what is his purpose, you know, who right. is Christ, so that that becomes the message and the fullness of one's perspective. This is Christ. And I want to share that Christ in whatever circumstance. So to me, the circumstance becomes the secondary point in this. So I will not focus on whether this is the circumstance or that circumstance, but you're so fully called to him yeah. that he is the one that you would proclaim no matter what. Exactly. And, and that's, that's exactly, well put. I mean, it's, it's uh, if we start getting our, um, we start seeing what kind of disciples we raise when they start focusing on the wrong thing. And, and it comes back to us and what we what we focused upon. And so it's a good reminder to us to keep our focus on the Lord. And it's often talked about, you know, even as we looked at the passage this morning, Philippians, what was it, 4? Um, uh, you know, when they're to be in the Lord, they're to be in harmony in the Lord, to be in, in unity in the Lord, um, to stand firm in the Lord. It is the Lord which brings all those things together. Uh, and, and we're to be in the Lord in this way is what Paul says in Philippians 4. And uh, you know, it's, again, these things are a good reminder to us. Uh, again, Osgoodness is, is a faithful uh, recaller of those, uh, of those things. And, uh, so, so thank you. Right, any, any other questions, criticisms, complaints, existential crises? Um, Mark, yeah. So 
Paul put in prison just the second time and for proclaiming the gospel. Is that the reason he's? Yeah, it seems like Nero, Nero was objecting to him disturbing the peace a little bit, uh, a rabble rousing. It was less about disturbing the peace like he did it in Ephesus, where he would uh, kind of shut down parts of the economy. But it's more about you know people coming to Christ and then no longer in, engaging in um, in emperor worship or in in uh, no, they were making better citizens, but they were still now they were aligned against a different god than us, and so thought thought of very poorly. And and Nero didn't like the competition. It seems like. All right, so let's go to uh, anything else, anybody? Okay, verse fifteen. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. So when we come to the Verse 15, it says some. And then, you know, the first question that comes to my mind is, what do you mean some? I mean, like some, like 10%, some 50%. And we'll be, we'll be unsatisfied with any answer. There's not any kind of hint given that at all. But they were likely known by the Philippians. So that's kind of the interesting part is when Paul talks about the some, he's referring to a known entity. Again, Paul is not writing this letter out of the blue. And uh, even though he's away from them, Again, he's had someone come to him with questions and observations and wants Paul to help a little bit with that. And so Paul's writing this letter. He, he gives it to Epaphras to take back, but Epaphras was the one sent from, from Philippi. So when he says some are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, Paul, it's an objective fact that Epaphras is probably passed along. Um, we don't know how many, but they're probably well known to the Philippians, uh, though not to us. And then when he talks about envy, or yeah, he talks about envy uh, and strife, envy is, is just simply the idea of jealousy. Um, you recall that that's the same emotion that, uh, that uh, Judas had when he turned Jesus over to the Romans. It was envy and jealousy. Um, others were seeking to undermine Paul's activities. Remember, Judas really didn't think the kingdom should come in the way that Jesus was describing it, which means he really didn't have an idea who Jesus was. So this idea of envy or jealousy is that you're misguessing somebody's intent and you're, you're content to go against them. <clears throat> you're content to, to uh, do something which makes them look bad. Um, also in, in the verse, you know, it says strife as well. Strife is an engagement in rivalry. I mean, they're meant to be parallel. They're meant to amplify each other. They're meant to be parallel like Proverbs does quite a bit. Uh, strife is the idea of engagement in rivalry, especially with reference to positions taken. It's discord, it's contention. Um, you know, it's, it's when someone purposely stirs up somebody, you know, one person against another. So they're purposely teaching something in order to get this, this group of people stirred up so that the other person looks bad. And in some sense, that's, that's how you know someone's an enemy. Now, this comes up actually, frankly, in, in marriage counseling, I see this quite a bit. I kind of have to educate people that um, the way that they handle things, when they broadcast, when they, when they tell others about the sins of their spouse or difficulties, that um, they're not being a friend, they're being an enemy. And you go, well, what do you mean enemy? Because an enemy is there not for your good, but for your harm. A friend is there for your good. And may say things that are difficult to understand or, or um, difficult to hear, but no, nonetheless truthful. But envy and strife usually comes about with someone looking to stir up trouble and looking to do something for your harm. And in this case, they were likely looking to make Paul look bad. You know, if Paul were really righteous, he wouldn't be in prison because look how God protects the righteous. You see that all throughout the Old Testament. The righteous, who's ever seen them beg for bread? I mean, really. And yet what you find is people, again, taking things out of context and people looking to make Paul look bad, and especially with what they're preaching. So that's the nature of the contention that's here. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ, even from envy and strife. 
but some also from goodwill. Now, this is kind of interesting in that Paul may not have had a hand in approving every last preacher, but he says that you know, those that are preaching are goodwill, he kind of puts their, uh, says this is a good thing that they're preaching. They don't have to be appointed by me to be able to preach the word, but rather that those who are preaching of goodwill that are kindly disposed or kindly inclined. Uh, and I think this is the interesting part about the passage. We can start to see uh, the outline of Paul's intent here, spurred on by envy and, or, and rivalry or strife, some leaders act as Paul's enemies. Paul's suffering and his imprisonment created the opportunity to run Paul's name through the mud and make themselves look better. Uh, but Paul's really trying to say, in some sense, it's irrespective of what their motive is, if they're preaching Christ and him crucified, all the better. And, and this is where we have a, like, how does that, how does that go? How does that occur? Because the message is not authenticated by the messenger in the sense of if, if the messenger is proved to be invalid because of intent or uh, misdirection, that doesn't change the message if it comes from God. Now, let me give you an example. Um, how many of you heard the song of Majesty? Let me rephrase it. How many of you heard the song of Majesty today? <laughs> All right. Um, I would call the guy who wrote that song a heretic. You may quote me. Does that make the song less worth singing? Absolutely not. Every word in that song is true. Every word in that song. And so we have to be careful at saying that who else, who someone identifies with and what they do somehow taints every last aspect of their ministry. Now, again, this, this is church history day, right? So there was a group of people called the Donatists who were in the third century and Paul ran across, or uh, Augustine ran across them again in the fourth century. And the Donatists were saying, all those people who bowed the knee to people through Diocletian and all the others who um, caused such terror throughout, um, those people who bowed the knee and were essentially you know, run out of, out of church on a rail, um, every last aspect of their ministry is suspect. Every person who those bishops appointed in place, they're suspect as well. All their, they all have to be rebaptized. They all have, and you have to be retaught. It's worthless because they had done this thing. And Augustine pretty much came across and said, "What are you smoking?" <laughs> the, the message comes about because it's from God through the agency of these individuals, not just because the individual came up with it. And, and, and so again, just kind of reflection in history, we don't discard something just because it came from so-and-so and they're tainted. Uh, otherwise, you know, there, are, there are, are songs we can sing who are, you'd be, you'd be curious as to what some of their, their other songs were, but the songs we choose are careful and they're thoughtful and they're scriptural. And we don't stop singing them just because they came from uh, a guy who's a, a Pentecostal. <laughs> <laughs> Does that, make, does that make sense, first of all? Yes. And it okay. clarifies. Okay. All right. So, so sing majesty. Virulently. Virulently. My tongue does not work with that. Enthusiastically. Enthusiastically. With zeal and vim and vigor. Um, yeah. So, so again, what Paul's trying to say here is that same sense. Yes, they're preaching from impure motives, but are they preaching Christ? It's where, what Paul really gets you to stop and think about. Are they preaching Christ? And if you say yes, you say, then God's glorified. Forget the motive. We're, we're going to talk about unity throughout the entire chapter, throughout the entire letter. We'll talk about unity. We'll correct those things. But don't have them stop preaching Christ just because I didn't appoint them, number one, and they've got a wrong motive, number two. Right? That's coming into the error of the Donatists in another 300 years. So again, uh, third and fourth century is really crucial for understanding a lot of our current issues today. So uh, so bone up on your church history this week. There'll be a quiz next week. <laughs> All right. So the, when he says, uh, verse 16, the latter do it out of love, knowing that uh, I am appointed. Uh, I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The idea of appointed there is specifically pointing back to Jesus' appointment, back to Ami's point, of, of Jesus as an apostle. And his recollection at this point, uh, those who preach out of goodwill do so out of pure motives and love. And those who preach out of envy and strife do so because of selfish ambition. 
and they look actively to cause Paul and the ministry harm so that they look good. We understand their motives and we're not necessarily happy with it, but that doesn't mean that they didn't necessarily stop. We'll correct the other attitudes later on. Their ambition, again, is for their own good. Um, the idea behind selfish ambition is almost a preacher for hire. They were saying things, sometimes they were saying things, they might have been preaching Christ, but they were saying them out of desire for money and for, for gain, good, good gain. Um, the idea of pure motives here is that the idea, literally, there is actually is no word motives in the Greek. It just says literally pure. Now, it doesn't change the sense, but you know, there's just one word that you're trying to, to get there. And he says, um, the former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition rather than purely, thinking, me, thinking to cause me distress in my, um, in my imprisonment. Again, this, the idea of thinking here, uh, the idea of supposing, to consider something to be true, but with an aspect of tentativeness. So let's read this again. Um, when he says the former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, rather than pure motives, thinking to cause me distress. They were thinking it, but not firmly convinced. There's an idea of, well, it could be that we could cause him problems, but you know, we might be preaching the truth. So we'll keep going, but I don't know what else. It, it's not that certainty and firmness of, this is what we know we're doing, but there's a tentativeness to what they're what, what they're thinking through. Um, and again, the idea that they're causing distress, affliction, anguish, things that would cause Paul to be upset and concerned as he's in prison. And especially when you start going through those things alone, when you start going through those things alone, you're, you can tend to exaggerate in your own life. And part of what Paul walks us through the book of Philippians is the idea of being content and getting our thinking straight, our conviction straight. I mentioned that word conviction or think. Um, it's mentioned 10 times in this passage. Whatever, it, not, not this passage, 10 times in the entire book. I mean, quite a bit out of Paul's lexicon of words. He chooses to use that word kind of to bind the chapter one to chapter four and everything in between. Thinking is critical to this, to this book. It's thinking with conviction, though, from what, what the Spirit provides. Um, so again, there caused me distress in my imprisonment. So when, can, you, can you begin to put yourself in Paul's spot? How frustrating this would be? Knowing you, you know, this has been 10 years on, as, as uh, I mentioned last week and Len mentioned again this morning. It's been 10 years on since the church was founded. And the church is in a pretty good spot. We've got elders and deacons. We've got um, probably multiple house churches, probably. Uh, at least, you know, the, the house church in, in Lydia's place is probably no more than 50 people. It's not an enormous church. But you know that there are these preachers starting to pop up and they've got a misintent and they're malintent. And, and Paul's beginning to see all this happen. And so Epaphras comes and gets him a report and says, you know, this is what we see going on. And here's some questions we've got. Can you help answer them? And so Paul's writing this letter back as a result. Can you start to those sense of, uh, is Paul frustrated and wringing his hands and saying, I don't know what to do. What are we going to do with all these troublemakers and schismatic people? And Paul will later on, by the way, and Titus tell us exactly what to do with people who are schismatic and causing problems, right? Uh, warn them once, warn them twice, give them the boot. Uh, he's, he could not be more blunt in that passage. Not, the, not this passage. Though. And here he's saying they may have the wrong motives, but they're preaching Christ. And he's not wringing his hands. Paul is demonstrating the contentedness that you see throughout the entire letter. In fact, he tries to assure the Philippians that God has it under control. <clears throat> this is important. Um, it's important because it's what we've seen even in the life of Grace Fellowship Church over time. There have been events that you walk out of either a meeting or the discovery of new information and you're wringing your hands. You don't know what to do. And I'm talking about throughout our entire church life. There are just things that happen. You don't know what to do. But this is where, part, you know, when you start to see the Old Testament and New Testament come together, the high priest was supposed to do what with his robes? Remember? 
in, in case of trouble, what was actually what was the high priest never supposed to do with his robes? He was never supposed to tear his robes. Ever. Do you ever think about that? The high priest was never supposed to tear his robes. What did the high priest do, by the way, when Jesus, by confronted by Jesus? He tore his robes. Yes. So number one, the high priest, probably a good student of Old Testament, did what the Old Testament God specifically said not to. But part of the reason for the not tearing your robes is you're really showing, you're showing a lament that things are so out of control that you're crying out to God, things are out of control, what are you doing? The high priest as leader of God's people is not supposed to show that level of out of controlness. He's supposed to show, as Paul does here, God is always in control. And if you don't have that kind of conviction, frankly, you're not a church leader. If, if all you do is look at the problems and wring your hands, we've got some growing up to do, to be blunt. I hope I'm not being a kind, but church problems happen in the church just all the time. And it's no time for anybody to be wringing their hands and saying, God's out of control. It's out of control. I don't know what God's doing. You may not know what God's doing, but God is in control. Paul doesn't let his disappointment or his rival's actions get him off his agenda. And he doesn't let their success or failures manage his emotions for him. He is content. Now that's not to say he's not exercised. <clears throat> you can be sure Paul's praying. You can be sure Paul's looking to the God who has it under control, saying, I'm not sure what's going on here. I know you've got it together. Can you, can you shed me a little light here? Now, he's looking for God's direction, but he's not out of control with his emotions. He has, as, as Len reminded us, he's got his emotions in check because he knows his theology is straight and his thinking is straight and his love of Jesus is straight. Our natural response when we're suffering usually due to someone else's intentions, whether good or bad, is to do one of two things. We can escape or we can, we can fight. But the idea of escaping is we, we can withdraw, um, kind of thinking that we, we can deny it or ignore it, that it'll go away. And when that doesn't work, then we, we actually flee uh, because running away takes care of everything all the time, doesn't it? <laughs> or, or we commit kind of, a kind of suicide where we kind of withdraw completely. And that's, that's some people's natural reaction when things come up and they say, well, this disturbance is, this is not God. And they just walk away. And that's not the way God's providence works. Our circumstances actually bring up and highlight what's in, in our hearts. And escape is not that which brings any glory to God. But the opposite is also true. The idea of escape and an attack. The idea of attack is we assault the other person, sometimes physically, sometimes verbally, but in any case, we go on the offensive. I'm going to have my way. I'm going to prove myself right. I'm going to be doing, I'm going to sing everything, anybody who will listen about the wrong that was done to me. Paul could have done that. Did Paul bring up Nero in this chapter whatsoever? No, he said, I'm in prison because God's opened the opportunity. He knew God was ultimately behind him. So Paul doesn't attack. But sometimes we do, don't we? Or we go the next step. We go from attack to litigation, where we'll sue, in, in, you know, literally or, or figuratively. We'll, we'll take someone to court if we've been wronged or financially harmed. Or we'll go to the court of public opinion, like Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. Mm -hmm. I, heard, I heard this week about a, a, a family that was having a problem with their daughter. Um, they, they, for, for right or wrong, they had kicked their daughter out of the house for some well, actually, they gave her a challenge, and she, they said, you know, here's the line we don't want you to cross, and she put her toe right on that line, and so they said, see you later. Um, so, I mean, it was, a, it was a choice on both of their parts. Um, to shame the parents, the, the daughter and some friends of hers then brought all their cameras over and brought, um, she said, I need to come by and pick up some more clothes. And so the parents said, okay, great, we'll get them out here. And then the, child, the, the daughter and her friends orchestrated an event and then put it on TikTok in order to shame the parents at, well, see what kind of parents I have. They kicked me out of the house and they won't give me any clothes. That's, that's kind of an attack, isn't it? That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's not passive aggressive. That's aggressive aggressive. 
Um, very false witness. I'm sorry. Very false witness. Very false witness. Yeah. Um, so we can we can sue. We can get we can get the, we can get our opinion out there with the court of of uh, public opinion, or sometimes without any satisfaction or any gatekeeper, we can commit murder. Somebody's eyes just went like this. What? <laughs> but think about it. When Jesus said, "I hate someone in my heart," what's he saying? You're committing murder. And so we, we kind of lose that perspective. Again, the Jewish mind is not, they're not, they don't deal in abstracts. This is the important part about the, even the, both the Old and New Testament. Jesus is letting us know that the, the murder comes from what, what's in our heart. And Jesus is letting us know, not on an abstract basis, but a concrete basis. It starts within us. And we, we're without any constraint or gatekeeper, um, we're, uh, we're left to go down that, that path. Um, the year is 1981, and I'm down in Southern Illinois. I'm selling insurance door to door for reasons I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and we're in a in a town that uh, a tornado is going through. Uh, it's going. And luckily, it's going through about a mile and a half or south of where we are. But across the the street uh, in the hotel, germ ridden hotel that we're in, <laughs> um, the gas stations. Uh, the governor is broken on the this rotating sign. And so with the wind picking up, that sign is just spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. And that kind of describes what goes on here when we don't have a governor on our heart and on our actions. We, when we get into attack mode or even escape mode, we just keep getting faster and faster and faster and declining and either running away or attacking others. What Paul demonstrates in this whole thing is, is a better way, really the best way. He, he acknowledges that we'll, what, what God's doing in spite of the circumstances. And in some sense, he overlooks the offense. We've seen how Paul addresses sin in the camp when we, we went through 2 Corinthians. He, he did so with sorrow. He was capable, and he, and he did it when it was necessary. But here he's not doing that so much, which is kind of instructive, that the nature of the offense was still Christ was being proclaimed even if from impure motives. Um, he did so, let's see, uh, he, he touches on it and he moves on because God is in the details. In the Corinthians passages, uh, he couldn't overlook the offense because of the reputation of God's name was at stake and on the line. And so he addresses it and seeks to reconcile with the church there. Here, he will instruct them on what unity is and what being convictionally unified means. And that's the whole message of the whole book. Um, but he says in, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4, which we'll get to in uh, some time, do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interests of others. Again, are, are they, these people are friends or are they enemies? And then and putting it back on us then, I look to get the log out of my own eye first. Am I that person's friend or am I their enemy? Because how I view them will be how I treat them. And if I'm not treating them as a friend with their best interest at heart, I'm their enemy. I'm doing exactly what they're doing. So Paul's not, Paul's giving an example here. Again, this, this verse plays a massive part in the reconciliation process, whether it's, a, whether it's marriages or businesses or anything else a Christian is engaged in, looking to the other person's interests in front of mine. And we often get so hung up uh, on our ideas and our own agendas that we fail to look through the issue with someone else's eyes. We fail to get the log out of our own eye first. And I think as we, again, kind of stop here at this point, Paul's really demonstrating for us that they might be an enemy of Christ for their envy and their motives, but they're not an enemy of Paul's. And Paul's not treating them like enemies. He'll attack the unity and the convictional unity later on. But he's not running, the, he doesn't tell us even who they are. He's not running their name through the mud. He's questioning their motive. He'll attack that later and separately. But here he's looking to say, but in our circumstances, I'm content because God is in control. May it be so with us. <clears throat> Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for this morning and again, the concentration upon the book of Philippians. And we see the unity that you desire to pull your church together. Lord, may it be that way with us. May we have this desire to be treat one another like friends and not enemies. May we be aligned with your word. May we be aligned and see you in the circumstances uh, so that you're glorified and we bend the knee to you.
So be with us today. Give us rest, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.